let's go to our first fundamental theorem of asset pricing, which uh, says the following. It says that, as basically uh, we already commented in that graph, it says that having no arbitrage in your model for a financial market is the same as having at least one equivalent martingale measure EMM in your model. Okay, so it's kind of a theorem that you have to see and have in the back of your mind and then you can kind of forget it in the sense that if you are working with the models that other people have introduced probably uh, the other people and if the, these are well-known models usually other people have checked everyone has already checked that those models don't have arbitrage in them so you're safe you don't have to worry about it however if you are creating your new model uh, then this is a useful theorem uh, because it gives you a way to check whether in your model there is arbitrage or not. Okay? It's, uh, it's actually typically easier to check whether there is at least at least one uh, equivalent martingale probability, equivalent martingale measure, th than checking for all possibilities of arbitrage and if there is arbitrage or not. Okay? So it, it, it actually is a workable way of finding whether your model has arbitrage or not is to check whether uh, whether there exists at least one equivalent martingale measure. Okay. So there is a historical story, uh, example about this that I usually tell in class. Um, Mandelbrot, uh, a famous mathematician of fractal fame, uh, popularized fractals, already in the 60s, late 60s, he suggested to use something called fractional Brownian motion as the model for uh, stock prices. Uh, and then several decades later, much, much later, people, uh, financial mathematicians, proved that in fact there is arbitrage in that model. How did they prove it? Exactly using this theorem. They proved that with fractional Brownian motion, you cannot change the probability to make the discounted stock prices martingales. So in principle, there is arbitrage in that model, except then even Later, uh, other financial mathematicians proved that, uh, uh, which was maybe 10 years ago and not so long time ago, they proved that if you have at least, uh, no matter how small, but some positive transaction costs when you move money from the bank account to the stock, actually arbitrage disappears in the even with the fractional brand motion. Okay? So the original model, model by Mandelbrot was all right, as soon as you introduce also transaction costs in your model, which in reality there are transaction costs. However, mm, people don't really use much that model. I, it's already hard to work with the fractional brand motion, and then if you introduce transaction costs, it's even harder. So it's not very practical. In, fa in fact, Malvin brought much later used uh, different models, uh, suggested different models, which uh, did not have arbitrage with even without transaction costs in them. All right, so that, that's kind of where these type of theorems come in when you are introducing new models. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to prove this, uh, except I will prove one direction, which is easy, in fact. So I'm going to prove this direction that uh, if there exists at least one equivalent martingale measure, then there is no arbitrary. Okay. The other direction to prove that for no arbitrage applies existence of at least one equivalent mar martingale measure usually involves uh, using a Hambanach separating theorem from functional analysis. And in fact, it's actually you know I stated this theorem as being true always. It has to. It becomes technical in more sophisticated models, and best mathematicians in the world have worked on this. But result is well, pretty much true in any type of models, but, but, but it's hard to prove in, this, in that direction to, to, to show that under appropriate definition of arbitrage there exists at least one equivalent martingale measure. Let's see the easy direction. Let's assume there exists at least one equivalent martingale measure, and let's prove that there is no arbitrage. Okay, uh, let's be careful about what we call arbitrage here. Uh, what so far, I, I have used 
arbitrage in, in kind of a strong sense. You make profits for sure. Uh, this is a bit definition of a bit weaker definition of arbitrage. Uh, we will say there is arbitrage if for some uh, capital T I can find a strategy such that the corresponding wealth process starts at zero. Money uh, is always non-negative. There are no losses in the future at the future time capital T with probability one. Okay, so there's zero probability of losses. And probability of having strictly positive profit is strictly positive. Okay? So this is written in mathematical notation. In English, uh, an arbitrage is uh, existence of a strategy which starts at zero. At some future time, uh, it's uh, never below zero, never has losses, uh, and actually has a positive chance of having positive, strictly positive profit. Okay. So that's a formal definition of arbitrage. Uh, so now let's prove that this cannot happen altogether. These properties cannot hold if I have, if there is in my model an equivalent martingale measure. Uh, okay, suppose there exists such a measure Q, and um, let's then by the martingale property. So by equivalent martingale measure, as we already argued, it's not just that the underlying assets will be martingales when discounted, but also the discounted wealth process is going to be martingale. So this is the martingale property. Uh, initial value, discount initial value, which is just initial value, is equal to the expectation under the martingale probability of the future discounted value. Hmm? The, just the martingale property by definition of Q, by Q being a, a, an EMM, this has to hold. Okay. Now I claim if I have something like this, like arbitrage, always non-negative and sometimes positive, then this has to be strictly positive. Well, look at this. This is, the, you know, expectations are either sums or integrals. Th this is summing things which are always uh, either zero or above zero, and some of these are strictly above zero uh, with strict with positive probability. So, expectation is going to be strictly positive. Has to be. Yeah? If you have something which is always above and uh, never below zero, and sometimes above zero, and the average is going to be strictly positive. Uh, all right, which means that x of zero has to be strictly positive. So I cannot have this. If I have this and this, uh, if I have the the other two properties of arbitrage, I cannot have this one. Uh, if I if I never have losses in the future and sometimes have profits, and I have a current Martin measure, my initial wealth, my initial uh, position has to be. I have to invest some money. I cannot start with zero. So that was easy. That direction, that direction was easy. As I mentioned, the other direction uh, is not necessarily easy. Not so hard in, in a simple one-period model, but but in general, uh, not easy. So, but it's true also in the other direction. Sometimes under additional technical conditions. Okay, so that was our first theorem. Uh, First fundamental theorem of asset pricing. A second fundamental theorem of asset pricing. And this is this completeness notion. So uh, we say that uh, market model is complete if every random payoff, every claim can be replicated by trading in the market. Okay? So Everything can be replicated. So this is an idealized situation in which um, really options and derivatives would be redundant and not necessary because you can just replicate their payoffs by trading in the basic assets. Uh, nevertheless, even though this is in reality never quite true, uh, it's a benchmark, it's a perfect situation, in, in, and uh, in particular our binomial model and our Black-Scholes Merton model will be complete. So, the, the second theorem says, I, if there is no arbitrage and I have completeness, every payoff can be replicated, 
then by no arbitrage, I already know there has to uh, exist uh, ex uh, at least one equivalent martingale measure. If I also have completeness, there exists exactly one, only one. Okay? There is only one martingale measure. So I'm not going to prove this. Uh, yeah, I'm going just to uh, state it here, and again, we will have it in the back of our mind. Uh, and uh, for practical purposes, at least for pricing, we will not need it that much. For hedging, it becomes an issue. Uh, but but uh, it's hopefully easy to understand the statement. Okay, So ha being able to replicate everything at the same time if the model has no arbitrage, that's the same as having exactly one martingale probability. Okay? That's an easy situation. Every claim has a unique price is such a, in such a case uh, which is equal to the cost of replication and as we saw uh, in, pre in a previous set of slides it's also equal to the expected value under the unique equivalent martingale measure <coughs> actually even in an incomplete market uh, in a in a practice people usually assume well there is one equivalent martingale measure among many that the market chooses to price all the derivatives so all i need to do is to look at the market data estimate what that q is and i'm going to use it if i'm say an investment bank i'm going to use that q to price everything okay so there, are, there may be many queues if the market is incomplete but i'm going to estimate from the derivatives data which q the market is using and i'm going to use it to price other other things that I'm selling, let's say, so that that's calibration uh, of your model. We'll talk about that later. Uh, uh, right now, let me just let me just uh, kind of just give a little bit more life into this. What's happening? So I know, I know in a complete market that the price of a claim is going to be E Q. Let's say price at time zero. So I'm not going to write T here. Uh, discounted claim, so let's write it just a C bar for discounting at capital T. Yeah. This is the price if I can replicate the claim, uh, in, uh, or if you know if there is only one Q, I can replicate every claim. Now, what's going to happen in an incomplete market? I'm going to have a maximum here, or maybe a supremum. Uh, let's say maximum over all Qs which are equivalent martingale measures. And then I can also compute a minimum of the same thing. Okay, a minimum of uh, kind of prices under every Q. A and so in, in a complete market, minimum and maximum are going to be the same. There's only one Q. Uh, but, but in general, a minimum is going to be smaller than a maximum. So price, uh, let's say C of 0, is going to be less or equal than the max. Oh, this is now a mess. Let me try to be more careful here. So this is going to be less or equal C of 0, less or equal than the maximum. Okay? This is arbitrage or no arbitrage prices. No arbitrage price. Any price between the minimum and the maximum is a no arbitrage price. Okay. So, in practice, so this is looks very mathematical and theoretical, but actually in practice, something like this happens. Uh, again, you can think of a bid ask spread, uh, the asking price and the, and the um, offering price for for a derivative. In more developed financial markets, like say New York Stock Exchange you will have much uh, um, smaller bid as spread which basically says the market is more complete okay? there is more easy it's easier to replicate claims or approximately replicate claims in less developed markets or let's say stock exchanges or less developed countries bid as spreads will typically be higher and, and this theoretically you can explain as not being able to replicate or even approximate the claims so the price can be an no arbitrage price can be anything inside a, a wider interval and now it depends on other factors uh, how to choose the price it has to be factors in terms of risk preferences some subjective 
uh, criteria, but not it's, ju it's not just no arbitrage. It has to be some other criteria to determine what the price is. Okay, so so this this has been on a kind of very abstract level, uh, but hopefully relatively intuitive, not not too hard to to understand what the claims are. Uh, and so it's good to know these theorems, but for practical purposes, uh, I'm going to mention them, uh, but I'm not going to directly need them. Uh, so now we we are going to to go more towards practical computation of option prices.